and sisters. I'm sure you'll agree with me when I say, what a fellowship. Amen. Amen. And this is just a foretaste of heaven. If you haven't done so already, please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul uses a metaphor. A metaphor is an assumed comparison. We've talked about similes. Similes are a stated comparison. The devil walketh about as a roaring lion. That's a simile. A metaphor is an assumed comparison. So Paul is comparing the human body with the spiritual body to help us better understand the working of the Lord's church, the spiritual body, the body of Christ, of which he is the head. And he does a masterful job, and it really helps us to understand the way the body works and how body life should be. So let's begin. Let's go down to verse 4. <clears throat> there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Now go down to verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. For as the body is one, and we think of that word one, we think of something that's unified, don't we? Something that's, there's unity there, there's harmony, there's, there's balance. And so he says, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. That's how you and I are here today. We were baptized into the body of Christ. The Lord added me and you to the church, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So now go to verse 18. But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. Who has set the members? God. God added to the church, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. He has set the members in the body, each one of them, that includes you, that includes me, in the body, just as he pleased. So God is the one organizing and orchestrating the body of Christ. Now verse 22. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. So actually I've got to revert. I've got to continue on here. Uh, verse 19. Let's go to that. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body. He's the one organizing and orchestrating all this having given greater honor to the part which lacks it, that there should be no schism or division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Now, that really helps you and me to understand how the body is to function. The organization, the orchestration, the the working of the body and how body life is to be. 
So what are some things that we see in this text as it concerns the organization and the function of the body, which is the Lord's church, the family of God, and how members are to relate to one another? Well, we see a stress on unity, don't we? We see there's harmony. We see there's balance. We see a harmonious balance, the working of the body. It's a beautiful picture that Paul portrays for you and for me to help us understand this. Um, there's no division in the body. There should be no division in the body. And there should be equal concern of the members one of another. And notice also, the way Paul describes this, there is an interconnection of the members, isn't there? There's an interconnection of the members. There's an interrelation of the members. And not only is there an interconnection and an interrelation, and this, this um, prefix inter we get from the Latin, it means um, among or mutually, reciproc reciprocally, together. So here we are together as many members in one body. That's the idea. So there's this interconnection, there's this interrelation. But not only that, there's also an interdependence, isn't there? There's an interdependence. What does that mean? It means we need each other, brothers and sisters. We need each other in the body of Christ. It's the way God designed it. All parts working together for the good of the body, for the common good and working of the body, which is the Lord's church. Now, who is organizing and orchestrating all this? God. We see that very plainly in the text. Uh, Christ, who is the head of the body. Head is synonymous with authority. So the body takes its orders from the head and not the other way around. And then we see there's, there's up in verse uh, 4 and 5, there are different gifts with the same spirit, different service or different ways to serve or different ministries, but the same Lord. There's different uh, workings, different activities, different operations, but the same God. Different ways that God works in and through people to accomplish His good purpose. And all these things are produced uh, by and affected by the power of God. So this is how the body of Christ is to function. This is how the family of God is to relate, how the members are to relate to one another. Now, question. What barriers exist that will inhibit body growth and prevent proper body function? We need to take a look at that. What obstacles are there that present a major hindrance to healthy family life and will cause discord, disharmony, disagreements, disputes, and overall dysfunction among God's children? Well, first, let's address this question in general terms, and then we'll identify and we'll discuss some of the specifics. In general terms, the problem is you. In general terms, the problem is me. Why? Because we're human. It's our humanness. We, we all share in the human condition. We all come short of the glory of God. We're all flawed individuals. We're imperfect. And so that is a large part of the problems that come about in the Lord's church. It's our humanness. It's our nature. It's our flesh. It's our pride. And the problem, to put it succinctly, is self. Now, when self is on the throne, what happens? When self is on the throne, you become self-centered. You become selfish. You become self-absorbed. You become self-opinionated. You become self-righteous. You become self-seeking. You become self-serving, self-sufficient and self-indulgent, and you engage in self-assertion, self-gratification, and often self-pity. When self is dominant, your problems are self-imposed, self-inflicted, and self-perpetuating, unless you get out of that mode. Now, how might the dominance of self in one 
two or more of the members of the body of Christ affect the body life and impact relationships within the family of God? Well, in general terms, we've identified the problem itself. To remedy, to remedy this problem, what needs to happen? Self must die. Now, in Luke 9.23, Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's important. Denial of self. And then Galatians 5.24, and I want to turn there. Galatians 5.24 says, And those who are Christ, so that's you and me, we're members in the body of Christ. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh. They've died to self. They have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And then Ephesians chapter 4, beginning of verse 22. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, in your attitude, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Finally, on this point, uh, 1 Peter First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Speaking of Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, on the cross, that we, having died to sins, we could put in, put in there, having died to self, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Now, whenever I... I have a choice. I can indulge self or I can deny self. And Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, which we read, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. So that's what God's will is. But when I indulge self, what are the results? When I indulge self, I become selfish, I become self-centered. Actually, I won't put that. <coughs> so I become selfish when I indulge self, and I become, secondly, self-centered. And third, I become self-absorbed. What's that mean? Self-absorbed. You ever been around anyone that's self-absorbed? The whole world revolves around me if I'm self-absorbed. You need to um, placate me, pamper me, take care of me, because the whole world revolves around me. That's what it means to be self-absorbed. It's ugly. It's not a pretty picture at all. Now, when I indulge self, I become selfish, self-centered, self-absorbed, and the works of the flesh, outlined there in Galatians chapter 5, the works of the flesh become evident in my life, and the result is, if you look at that list, and it's not an exhaustive list, the works of the flesh, I dishonor God through my actions, through my speech, through my thoughts, although you can't tell what I'm thinking, God, God can't. This is what happens when I choose, and it's a choice, when I choose to indulge self. However, when I choose to deny self, as Jesus says, I must, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself. What's that mean? I can't be who I am? I can't be Terry? No. It's when your will is opposed to God's will. You have a choice. You can do what you want to do, or you can do what God wants you to do. Remember Jesus' prayer, not my will, but thine be done. That's submission. That's surrender. That's obedience. That's where God wants you and me to be. 
So, when I deny self, I choose to deny self, say no to my will when it is opposed to God's will, instead of becoming selfish, <coughs> I become unselfish. I become selfless. In other words, just like so many scriptures point out, my interest is more on the good of others than on myself. I'm unselfish. I'm, I'm selfless. When I deny self, when I have crucified the flesh, when I have uh, said no to self, instead of becoming self-centered, I become God-centered. Much better. Much healthier. I become God-focused. We talked about focus in Bible class this morning. I become God-focused, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. That's where my focus needs to be. Not on myself. Not on my situation and circumstances. My focus needs to be on God. So instead of becoming self-centered, I become God-centered. Instead of becoming self-absorbed, which is not a pretty picture, I become spirit-filled. And because I become spirit-filled, then the fruit of the spirit becomes evident in my life instead of the works of the flesh. So love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, those things. And that's not an exhaustive, exhaustive list either. So instead of the works of the flesh becoming evident in my life, the fruit of the Spirit becomes evident in my life, and I, as a result, honor and glorify God through my life. <clears throat> and that, this is the category you and I want to be in. We want to be in this category. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is self must die. The flesh must be crucified. So, let's move on to some specifics now that we can glean out of our text. And as we study the Corinthian letters, we can identify some specific behaviors that, are pre that presented major hindrances to proper body function, and to healthy relationships within the Lord's church, within the family of God. And that's what we want to do. The first harmful hindrance, and that's what I call these, the first harmful hindrance is unjustified comparisons. The first harmful hindrance is unjustified comparisons. The Corinthians seem to be always engaged in this counterproductive practice, comparing their abilities with one another, comparing their spiritual gifts with one another, and who had taught them, and who had baptized them, and who they were following. I follow Paul. I follow Cephas. I follow Apollos. Oh, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided, Paul says? This is what they were doing, these unhealthy comparisons. Now, Paul's analogy of the body addresses the problem in 1 Corinthians 12, going back to 1 Corinthians 12, and this time looking at verses 15 and 16, that we didn't read before. <coughs> if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, Am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole uh, were hearing, where would be the smelling? And then down to verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Now, Reading this reminded me of a verse in a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And the poem is called The Builders. And there's a line in there that says, Nothing useless is or low. Each thing in its place is best. 
And what seems, but I don't show, strengthens and supports the rest. Isn't that good? The harmful hindrance of unjustified comparisons was causing division in the Corinthian church. And Paul asked them an excellent question in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. And it speaks directly to this problem. Paul asks, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? All that we have, brothers and sisters, has come from God. God is the source of all things. And we don't have anything, any talent, ability that we did not receive from God. So Paul makes a really good point there. Someone has observed, God's grace sustains the gift of life, its labor and reward. What we possess is not our own. It all comes from the Lord. And it does. Scripture says that. So if it all comes from the Lord, and He is the one who arranges all the parts of the body for His purpose and for His glory, why then should we engage in unjustified comparisons, unhealthy comparisons? The answer, we shouldn't. We shouldn't do it. Paul, in speaking to some in Corinth who were elevating themselves above others, including him, he says in... 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want to go over there. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. This is really good. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves. That's what we're talking about. We dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, you see what they were doing? And it's very unhealthy. It's not good. Paul says they're not wise. They're not wise. It's not good to do this. Don't do it. Stay away from this, these unhealthy comparisons. And I might add that when we engage in the harmful hindrance of unjustified comparisons, we're not wise either. We're really not wise to do that. And we miss the point. Because when we compare ourselves with those who we deem less talented than us or less gifted than us, what will the result likely be? Well, I'm going to be, if I'm comparing myself with someone I don't think is, is as good or accomplished as I am, I might become puffed up, right? I might become puffed up with pride, develop this spiritual arrogance, a condescending attitude, and have this attitude of uh, spiritual superiority. Is God pleased with that if I'm like that? No. He can't be. Now, what if I compare myself with those who are extremely talented and do things so much better than I can and seem to be so gifted in every way? What if I compare myself with them? What will the result likely be? Uh, feelings of inadequacy, Feelings of inferiority, I don't measure up, I can't do it, depression, stifling my ambition, why bother? Throw my hands up and just give up. God doesn't want me there. We need to avoid both of these extremes, don't we? So if we're going to compare ourselves with anyone, who should it be? Our example. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That's, he is our great example. That's who we should compare ourselves with, Jesus. Other comparisons can lead to sin and a whole host of problems, as it did with the church in Corinth. And before leaving this point, I'd like to share with you the wisdom found in Romans chapter 12. So I'm going to go back there. Romans chapter 12. Because we're talking about the body life, and Paul discusses that here. In verse 3, Romans chapter 12, Paul says, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Well, that's good stuff. 
that is really good for you and me to take his advice there. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. You see how everything goes back to God who is the source of all things, the blessed giver? We don't have anything that we did not first receive from his loving hand, do we? We have no right to boast or be arrogant or be prideful. For as we have many members in one body, we've heard that before, all members do not have the same function. We have different gifts, we have different talents, we have different abilities. We don't all have the same function in the body, just like it is with the human body. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. There's the idea of, of unity and the idea of this balance, this harmoniously working together, all the members working together for the common good. <clears throat> so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. <clears throat> We're interrelated, we're interconnected, we're interdependent upon each other. We need each other in the body of Christ. <clears throat> okay, the second harmful hindrance is unhealthy competition. Unhealthy competition. And this one actually has its roots and grows out of the first, which is unjustified comparisons. And like the first, the Corinthian church was actively engaged in this practice. If we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, First Corinthians chapter 3, and right, start right at verse 1. Brother, I could not speak to you as, as to spiritual people. He'd like to speak to them as spiritual people, but he can't. But as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Now this is not complimentary. And it pains the Apostle Paul to have to write this in this way. He'd like to be able to talk to them as spiritual, as spiritually mature people, but he can't. They're, they're, they're carnal. Babes in Christ, he says. And brethren, I could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as a carnal, as babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. Again, not complimentary to them. For you are still carnal. You are of the flesh. You're exhibiting this, the works of the flesh. How does he know that they're still carnal? He says, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men, unregenerated men, unspiritual? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, or who is Apollos, but ministers to whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? Again, it all goes back to God. <clears throat> I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither he who plants is anything, or he who waters, but God, who gives the increase. The glory goes to God. The honor goes to God. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. That is so complimentary. That is a status we want to be in. We are God's fellow workers. I just love that, that title. You are God's field. You are God's building. You know, we're, we're the temple of the Lord. He refers to the church as the temple of the Lord. In sports or in the military, healthy competition is used to encourage teamwork and usually results in a sense of accomplishment. That's in sports and in the military. But that is that the case in the Lord's church? No. It seems that just about the opposite is true in the church, where competition usually discourages teamwork and often results in division. Now Jesus pointed out to his disciples that the church doesn't operate or view things in the same way as the secular or corporate world. So I'm going to go back to Matthew chapter 20, where Jesus actually says this, Matthew 20, verse 25, 
And Jesus says, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. For whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. That's going to take some humility, isn't it? A humble spirit. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. This person here, the person who's self-absorbed, he wants to be first. He wants to be first. He's going to push his way forward, push to the front of the line, doesn't really care who he inconveniences or hurts. But Jesus says, if you desire to be first, then you become a slave. You become a servant. Just as the Son of Man, now he cites himself now as an example. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for men. Amen. So there's our example. There's who we should be focusing on and looking at. So while healthy competition definitely has its place in the secular world, unhealthy competition can be divisive and destructive within God's family, and we've seen it. Now, this unhealthy competition, when I thought about this, I thought about when Betty and I were at IBC, International Bible College, now Heritage Christian University, but we had these campaigns twice a year in the spring and in the fall. Usually six groups went out to six different cities somewhere in the United States. And what I found unsettling about these campaigns was when we got back and in, in chapel, there was this unhealthy comparison. Those who had lots of Bible studies and good responses and had lots of baptisms were held up and applauded. And those who didn't were kind of, you know, looked down upon. And it made the, the ones in those groups who worked just as hard, uh, knocked as many doors, worked just as hard, and had the same evangelistic spirit as all the rest, um, were made to feel bad. And I just found it to be very unhealthy, this competitive aspect. I kind of wish they wouldn't have fostered that. And I told the story before about when I was driving the school bus for Biddeford. I took a busload of kids up to Bates College for the, for the um, Special Olympics. I knew nothing about Special Olympics, but they told me, once you park your bus, you can come in and watch if you want. I said, okay. So I went in and watching these Special Olympics now. There's uh, like, I don't know, five or six lanes and these kids are doing a relay race, you know, with the baton. And they're running their hearts out, and one of the kids falls to the ground. All the rest of the kids stopped and went back to see if, if that boy was all right. That was incredible. I mean, that's healthy competition right there, because it was a competitive sport, but they were more concerned about the well-being of their fellow runner than they were about winning the race. And everybody stood up and cheered. I mean, they were all winners at that point. But that is the spirit that we need to cultivate and that we need to emulate. So how do we deal with the harmful hindrance of competition? Well, I think Galatians 6.4 has the answer. Each one should test his own actions. You're responsible for you. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to someone else or competing with someone else, we could say. The third and final harmful hindrance is unwholesome criticism. This is another harmful hindrance, unwholesome criticism. And here, a definition is in order. Criticism is defined as the act of passing severe judgment, censure, fault-finding. So this is meant to inflict hurt or harm or injury. To be critical is to be inclined to find fault or to judge with harsh severity, often too readily, often too eagerly. And back in the old days, I'd have people, especially in the military, I'd have people come up to me and say, Terry, can I give you some constructive criticism? Yeah. They let me have it. I'm like, whoa! So in later years, they said, Terry, can I give you some constructive criticism? I'd say, no. Really? I'd say, you can give me suggestions for improvement, but I could do without the criticism. See, it's a difference in motive. It's a difference in spirit. Um, I'll take suggestions for improvement all day long. 
but a lot of times this constructive criticism is meant to inflict harm and injury. So the harmful hindrance of criticism needs to be divided into two parts. First, there is self-criticism, and this is what we do to ourselves. And then there's our criticism of others. Those are the two categories. On self-criticism, or we could say self-deprecation, or self-flagellation, because we beat ourselves up a lot, the wise sage Sirach offers some timely wisdom. Now, Sirach is an old Jewish sage. He's one of the apocryphal books written between 200 and 180 B.C., uh, not inspired, but it's really good stuff. Believe me, it's just old Jewish wisdom. And Sirach says, don't underrate yourself. Humility deserves honor and respect, but a low opinion of yourself leads to sin. And then he says, my child, keep your self-respect, but remain modest. Value yourself at your true worth. There is no excuse for a person to run himself down. No one respects a person who has no respect for himself and I think that's good stuff when we underrate ourselves and we run ourselves down we grieve the Holy Spirit of God Moses in persisting in this harmful hindrance in Exodus chapter 4 actually makes the Lord angry remember Moses is trying to get out of what God is asking him to do I'm not eloquent who am I what can I do I can't do it find someone else he says and the Lord becomes angry the text says in verse 14 that the Lord's anger burned against Moses. Why is this? Well, it's because when we habitually engage in self-criticism, we perpetuate our spiritual immaturity and we restrict God's use of our lives for His purpose. We're pulling ourselves back. And this represents a severe lack of faith. It's a faith issue. And we are, in fact limiting God through our unbelief. And we're not taking God at His word, we're not embracing the hope of His promises, and we're not acting on the truth of His commands in Scripture. Instead of allowing God to use us as He sees fit, self-criticism causes us to hide our talent, to hide our light. That is, we shrink back from making our talents and abilities available to Him for Him to use. We pull back. And we're, when we're in this mode, we are, in fact, robbing God. Because God can't use us as He desires to when we're in that mode. Needless to say, this severely limits our effectiveness and our productivity for God and His kingdom. And we're most likely not all that easy to be around either when we're in this mode. Now, how do we eliminate this harmful hindrance? We need to decide to take God at His word, embrace the hope of His promises, and act on the truth of Scripture. We also need to learn that God's love for us is not based on our performance, but on our position in Christ. Now, we struggle with this, but if I have a bad day, does God love me less? If I have a good day, does God love me more? No, God's love is constant. He loved us even when we were sinners. Christ died for us even when we were powerless, helpless, hopeless, sinning against Him. That's when He died for us. God loves us. That's undeniable. So, <clears throat> our position in Christ is what is important. Our sense of self-worth has its foundation in the value that God has placed on our souls through the giving of His only begotten Son to redeem us from the consequences of sin. Now for the second part of this harmful hindrance, <clears throat> criticizing others. Once again, Sirach has something to say. He says, a fool cannot refrain from tactless criticism. You know the people, you've been around them. It's pretty much all they do, it's a hobby. And it's, it's very hurtful. And someone has noted when you throw dirt at people, you're not doing a thing but losing ground. Now that's cute, but it's really what's happening. You're hurting yourself. When you throw dirt at others, you're really hurting yourself more than you imagine. On a positive note, Abraham Lincoln said, he has the right to criticize who has the heart 
to help. Right. Now, when you've been approached by people and they say, can I give you some constructive criticism, you've known, you've been able to detect when they're really looking out for your best interest and trying to help you or when they're really trying to let you have it and put you in your place. You can tell the difference, right? It doesn't take a lot. You can, you can tell what their motive and intent is in what they do. So, and this one, most of us would rather be ruined by praise than helped by criticism. Nobody wants constructive criticism. It's all we can do to put up with constructive praise. And our brother Jim has this phrase, um, you, you draw more flies with honey than with vinegar. Pretty much the, the same thing. So, uh, Proverbs 11:12 says, He who is devoid of wisdom despises his neighbor. And the International Children's Bible, which was written on the third grade reading level, says, A person without good sense finds fault with his neighbor. A person without good sense criticizes his neighbor. And this is in a malicious way. So let's not be too eager to tell others they're false because we all have them, right? We're all imperfect. We all fall short. Now, are there times when we need to warn? Are there times when we need to correct? Are there times when we need to rebuke? Yes. There are times when we need to do that. But it's how we do it that's important. Paul in Ephesians 4.15 says, speaking the truth in love. There's the motive. There's the intent. Speaking the truth is going to the authority of God's Word, not giving Him a piece of my mind or putting them in their place, but speaking the truth. You're going to the authority of God's Word in love. You have their best interest at heart. You're trying to help them come into harmony with God's will. They're sinning in some way that is out of harmony with the Word of God, and you're using the authority of God's Word in a spirit of love. We've been approached, all of us in here probably, by people that had the, the interest, our best interest at heart, and we've appreciated that. We really have. We've felt the love. But we've also been approached with people that we know were out to really get us and work us over and do some harm and do some injury. We've been approached in both ways, and we can definitely tell the difference. So there are those times when we need to warn, when we need to correct, and we need to re rebuke. James, in James chapter 4, verse 11, he says, Speak not evil one of another, brethren, in the Lord's church, in the body of Christ. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Another version says, Do not criticize one another, my brothers. Don't get engaged in that. And Titus goes even further. In Titus chapter 3, verse 2, he says, Speak evil of no man, anyone. And there's a saying, if you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. Boy, if we could abide by that, wouldn't that be great? Um, speak, don't speak evil of or slander anyone. And Paul admonishes that we are to let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouths, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Don't you love that? For the use of edifying, what's that mean? Strengthening, building up. That's what our speech should do, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Another version says, Speak only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who hear or those who listen. So, that's, that's good for us to know. And Paul, again, in 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. That's what we need to be doing. The world, we're out there in the world, and we're getting beat up and torn down. They do a great job of that, right? When we come together in the body of Christ in the Lord's church, we should be strengthening and building one another up. Our brother Paul Bullock reminds us of Hebrews 10.25 all the time. Provoke unto love and good works. We're to be doing that to one another. Encouraging, strengthening, building up. And finally, as we close... Let's go to Romans chapter 14, and we'll close out. Book of Romans chapter 14. I'm going to get down to verse 7.
For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. <clears throat> it's because we're interconnected. We're interrelated. We're interdependent on one another in this harmonious balance in the body of Christ. It's a beautiful picture Amen. that Paul paints for us. So, we're, no man is an island. Uh, none of us lives to himself, none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living, those who have passed on and those who are still here. But why do you judge your brother? Now the word judge here is that critical, <coughs> fault-finding spirit, the condemning spirit. That's what he's talking about. Why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? There's the attitude. <clears throat> for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Equal footing when we stand at judgment. We'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ on equal footing as we stand before God to give account of ourselves. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. That word shall means it's going to happen. It's definite, it's certain, it's sure, it's going to happen. Every tongue, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. So then, verse 12, each of us, that excludes no one, each of us shall give account of himself to God. Not to a brother, not for a sister, but you'll give account of yourself to God. That's what we need to be concerned about. Verse 13, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. Let's not have this critical, fault-finding spirit, this condemning spirit anymore. But rather, resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Now down to verse 19. Therefore, because of what he said, let us pursue the things which make for peace in the body of Christ. This harmonious balance, no division. This harmonious balance of the interworking of the members in one body. Let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. That's a great word, edify. To strengthen, to build up. That's what we want to be about. Now down to verse, I mean, excuse me, chapter 15, verse 1. We then who are strong ought to bear with the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Jesus, it says, let each of us uh, please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. There's that word again. Strengthening, building up. That's what we want to be about in the body of Christ. For even Christ did not please himself. Jesus said in the Matthew 10 text we read, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Let that be said of, of you and me in the body of Christ. We don't want to be placated, to be pampered. Um, where are my feelings on my sleeve? I'm offended, you offended me. This, that, and the other. None of that in the body of Christ. Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve, and he calls you and me to be servants. And that takes humility. It takes a humble spirit. It takes meekness, and that's what God is trying to cultivate in all of us. So if you have um, unresolved, unrepented sin in your life, and God gives you this opportunity to confess that sin and to repent of it, he commands all men everywhere to mm -hmm. repent. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. If you have a need this morning, if you're carrying a burden that's too heavy for you, whatever we can do to assist you as your brothers and sisters in Christ, please come forward and make your request known as we stand and sing.